try that again. Good evening, Cross Life. Let us continue the worship of our God through the preaching of his word. Uh, turn with me to 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, and please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray. God, you are our faithful creator, the one in charge, the one with all power, the one who is faithful to keep your promises and sustain your people. And so in trials, in valleys, uh, may we see you, may we set our eyes on you and behold you by faith and trust ourselves to you, knowing that you will carry us through, that you will be glorified. And so we pray now that you speak through me and through your word and pierce our hearts. Let us love you more. I pray that you grant these things in your son's name. Amen. May be seated. So, you might be watching a skilled painter, and you see him start to paint a painting on a white canvas, and he paints a black circle in the middle. And if he stopped there, and you just said, wow, that's so ugly, he's probably not a very good painter, you'd be a little bit of a fool, because you know he's just starting. He's got more that he's going to keep painting. And if you keep watching, you'd see that he, yes, started the circle, but he adds vibrant colors to the outside of that circle. And they're beautiful petals. And that black circle is the center of the flower. That which was ugly is actually part of a bigger contrast and actually makes it more beautiful with the contrast it brings. And so likewise, Peter, he's been discussing the topic of suffering, a big black circle. And this is what he's been doing for us in the last chapter and a half. About midway through chapter 3, he switched his, his focus to suffering. And since then, he's been adding petals, adding beauty to the painting of suffering, adding more perspective. And so that first petal he added was an instruction to us that in the face of suffering, we need to honor Christ as Lord in our hearts and that the outflow of that needs to be modeling gospel behavior and word, deed, and action and attitude. And so the next pedal he adds is encouraging us through Christ's victory over suffering. He actually, he told us that it was through suffering that Jesus was finally vindicated and triumphed over his enemies. Christ walked the path of suffering that arrives at the gates of victory. And so he did this as an example that we might follow. And so Peter, he adds another pedal, adding us to, or commanding us to arm our minds, to prepare our minds to suffer and knowing that he's ultimately the judge that's going to take care of all things in the end. And then in the passage prior to this one, he put, keeping suffering perspective, he reminded us that the end is near. The end is at hand, so we need to be those who live in sober-minded prayer, fervent in love, faithful to use our gifts to serve one another. And then in today's passage, he's going to be adding a fresh angle on suffering, adding some of the final petals to this flower as he will conclude his thoughts on suffering in today's passage. And so in this passage, Peter gives us two truths about suffering that enable us to trust God. First, God ordains suffering. And second, there is a bigger picture to our suffering. Just to repeat that for note takers, Peter gives us two truths about suffering that enables us to trust God. First, that God ordains suffering. And second, that there is a bigger picture to our suffering. So first, starting with the point that God ordains our suffering. The first perspective we need to have is to see God's hand in our suffering, especially in our suffering and in our persecution. 
if you're persecuted, it's easy to see the circumstances or the people wronging you as infuriating. But this perspective, it fails to see God's hand is so active in every bit of our suffering. His sovereign, his loving, his wise hand is orchestrating and working through our suffering. And so let's look how we can see his ordaining hand first and how it falls within God's plan. He told us it's in his plan. Let's read verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So he starts out with the word beloved. Notably, he only uses this one other time in the book of Peter. It's in chapter 2, verse 11, where he warns the readers to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against their souls. Only there and here he uses them. And because before both those passages, in both of those passages, he's going to be reminding them of hard truths. They're going to be hard to swallow. And so he doesn't do so indifferently or uncaringly, but he prefaces it with love. His affection, it provides a sweet pillow for the readers to lay their head on before he delivers hard, necessary truths. Which, as a side note, we would do well to imitate his example when we exhort others and we tell them those hard truths to preface it in love. And so, in love, he warns them, do not be surprised at this fiery trial. Don't be bewildered. Don't be aghast. Don't have your jaw drop into the floor. Suffering, and particularly suffering for Christ's sake, as we'll see as Peter's main emphasis, it's all part of his plan. Jesus told us very clearly this would be the case. In John 15, 20, he says, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. And so this is part of the promised cost of being a disciple. And so he reminds us, Peter reminds us that this is part of the plan. It ought to be expected. We should expect to suffer, just like a soldier needs to expect to suffer in boot camp, because if he pictures it as a Hawaiian vacation, he'll get owned. Likewise, he reminds us with all clarity, we must not be surprised, but we need to expect fiery trial. Because God planned it, and he foretold us, he expects us to heed the warning so that we can brace ourselves. It's kind of like when someone comes up to you and they push you and you're not warned, then you're gonna, you fall over, you lose your balance. But if someone warns you, you can take a ready stance so that they can't move you when they push you. And so likewise, we can be in a ready stance so that our faith stands firm and it can resist the trial and we don't get knocked over. And we, we particularly need to heed this warning, those of us who are all in America, because historically, globally, Christ's suffering has always been the rule. Christian suffering has been the rule, not the exception. We in America, we've been the exception. We've enjoyed a lot of freedoms, lack of persecution, and it's a blessing. But we shouldn't take this period for granted. We need to use all the resources, the blessings we have, thank the Lord for, use it, for, for it, and use it to glorify God, to spread the gospel. But it also needs to be a warning for our hearts that we store so that when trial comes, we're not thrown off guard. We're like, what? Why are we enduring persecution? We need to be in a ready stance, seeing it as part of God's plan. And so we need to see that. God, he ordained it. He told us it's going to happen. But we also see his ordaining hand, and that suffering is a tool that he uses to, to grow and show our faith. It's one of the many tools he has in his toolkit. Read with me again verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. And so those words, a fiery trial coming to test you, they're eye-catching words, and they're also kind of strange. Why does he word it that way? Fiery trial, testing. When he's doing that, he's trying to jog the reader's mind to go back to what he said at the beginning of the letter. And so let's go there. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. He's stringing concepts together. First Peter 1, 6 through 7. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he's bringing back our minds to that, that same fire he was speaking of. It's the refiner's fire. 
And the refiner's fire is used for precious metals like gold. And what happens is they're put in a crucible and they're set above bright flames. And they're put under that intense heat not to be destroyed, but to be purified. Because the heat, it brings up the impurities to the surface of the metal. And it's scraped off the top. And ultimately, this process is to bring out the brilliance and display the true beauty and the value of that gold or that precious metal. And yet here he tells us that something more valuable than precious metals, our faith, is put over the fire that it might be refined, causing its true beauty to be shown and to be fit for his presence. He says, so that it might be, in today's text, tested. That word tested, it implies that one might pass a test and one might fail. And so what would it look like for faith to fail the test? It would mean that faith under fires, under tribulation and trial, it's shown to be not gold, but fool's gold, ingenuine. And so in terms of faith, it looks real, but when that expected trial comes, it jumps ship. It says in its heart, no, I'm not going to worship God in this. I only want to worship him in the good. It says, no way. I'm not following God through the furnace. When I signed up for this, I didn't want a hard life. I wanted an easy life, a comfortable one. And so... Under real pressure, the fool's gold, it shatters and is shown to be false and it abandons God. That's what it is for faith to fail the test. And so its true nature, it's revealed to be of no value at all. But what would it look like to pass the test? I think we see the answer in our next verse, verse 13, back in our passage. Verse 13 says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So first, let's look at some of those words, and then we're going to see how this shows a past test of genuine faith. So he starts, he tells us to rejoice, which is significant because he just told us before, don't be surprised that trials are going to come. And since we know trials are coming, the one response could be complaining, like, ugh, here's another trial. Or it could be the Eeyore, oh, here comes that trial, another one. But neither of these are to be our response. We're supposed to be contrast to that. We're supposed to rejoice. A continuous attitude of gladness and delight. Hmm. So he continues to fill in that perspective. He says, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Insofar, not a word I use every day, but it means to the extent of, the measure of. And so we're supposed to rejoice to whatever extent, it's not the same for everyone, that we share in Christ's sufferings. And that word share has a root many of us are familiar with, koinonia, fellowship. And so we have fellowship with the sufferings of Christ. This places us in good company. The insults and sufferings for God, it places us in the company of Christ himself. And the beauty of suffering is that it draws us into even greater communion, fellowship with our Lord. As someone wrote in a book I was reading lately, when God, calls it, when God calls us to suffer, he is offering us a privilege of understanding the incarnation of Christ. We better relate with the sufferings that Christ went through. And so he tells us to rejoice, not because we love suffering, we don't and nor should we, but we are to rejoice as much as we share in Christ's sufferings and are made like him in his death. But pay attention to this. This is not intuitive what he's about to say. He tells us to rejoice in the sufferings. Look at this. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So rejoice to the extent you share in his sufferings in order that, so that, it's a purpose clause, in order that we may rejoice and be glad at his return. That we may, that word uh, rejoice and be glad, it's super rejoice, to be abounding in a joy, exulting with jubilation and bubbling over. And so this will be the result when his glory is revealed when his splendidly radiant, completely eyeing, beautiful glory is displayed for us. Can we wait for that or what? But so how does this work? This is the non-intuitive part, that we rejoice in sufferings now, that we may rejoice at his return. How does that purpose, how do these connect? How do they relate to one another? And so this scoops back to that, that bigger question that we're answering when we're looking at this text. What does it mean to pass the test through fire? It means that our faith will be proved genuine. A genuine faith is seen when it rejoices in trial because it finds that koinonia, that communion with Christ in suffering. And this is more valuable to you than this world. world. So when God gave you true faith, 
Christ became your ultimate treasure, not the things of this world. And so when the things of this world are all burned up around us in fiery trial, your biggest treasure can't be touched. It's Christ, and so you rejoice. And hope in Christ is what remains in fiery suffering. And it reveals, if you rejoice in suffering, true faith. And it's only true faith that has a foretaste of the joy to come and rejoices now. And it's only a true faith that passes the test of fire. It's not destroyed from it, but actually the opposite. It benefits from it, from the refinement process. And it prepares the way for the believer for super pounding joy in his glorious return. As one commentator put it, he said, it is through rejoicing in trial that the Christian is made ready for the joy that expands into the fullness at the appearing of Christ. And so we need to see God's hand in our suffering. Not only that it's an intentional part of his plan that he forewarned us about, but it's being used by God to test and refine our true faith to fit us for glory. And so let us be those who embrace the purifying effect and find true joy in trial. You know what's amazing is that God, he ordains trials, and we've been seeing that. But part of his ordaining work is also that he blesses us in trial. Let's read verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And so Peter, he presents us the scenario of being insulted for our affiliation with Christ. Because being Christians and living like him, we're going to be insulted. Those of us who are tethered to Christ follow where he's gone. Like a water skier tethered to a boat. Where the boat goes and it goes over rocky waters, so does the water skier. And so we will be insulted. That word insulted, it means reviled or verbally abused. And it's predominantly, it means something to tear down your character. And while it's emphasizing the verbal aspect of persecution, it doesn't disregard that there could be physical, but his focus is on verbal, oftentimes which is more painful than the physical. And so he says, if you're insulted for Christ's sake, you're blessed. Blessed, that word makarios, it's found in the Beatitudes. It means happy, fortunate, well-off, or my favorite one is to be envied. And we actually see that the last Beatitude that Jesus says has a lot of similarity of phrases. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, I'll read it for you. It says, blessed are you when others revile, same word, insult you. And persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. That's that super rejoice. For your reward is great in heaven. So they, uh, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so we see blessed, we see insulted, we see rejoice in both texts. And so Jesus, what he was doing is he's telling us to rejoice for our future reward is great in heaven. And so he wants us in our, in our trial not to forget the future the eternal reward that far outweighs present suffering. And while Peter, he remembers Jesus' work, he also, he takes that, but he, instead of focusing on the eternal reward, he does that elsewhere. Here, he's focusing on the present. He says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. He's talking right now, in the midst of persecution. And the wording, it's, it's weird in English. It's even tougher in Greek. The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So it's referring to the Holy Spirit. He calls the Spirit of glory. And when he calls it the Spirit of glory, he's putting that in contrast to the, what we just saw as insults of the opposers. And also this word glory, we've seen it before, right? Last verse, that we will super rejoice when his glory is revealed. And so we will abound in joy when his glory is revealed, the outpouring of his character is displayed. And so the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of glory, He's going to make those realities of future glory true to our hearts in the midst of tribulation. So that in tribulation, we will know with certainty the riches of our glorious inheritance. And he endows the believer with a foretaste of glory in the heart. So that the Christian in trial is going to be able to imitate and magnify our Lord, rejoicing in suffering. And the beauty is God doesn't abandon us in trial. Rather, his spirit in our most severe trials will rest on us, work through us in special and intimate ways, giving us a foretaste of the glory to come. He'll make us those who are truly blessed. As I was reading this, I was also on the side reading another book. Um, It's what I call um, my book friends. It's a phrase me and Amber use a lot of times around the house. 
Um, so book friends, what I mean by that is not reading books with friends. I'm referring to dead people. Um, and making friends of dead people in the past, of faithful men and women who lived out their faith. Um, and this has actually part of been something me and Amber have been doing for the last few months is as a way to do what we talked about last time, to combat the entertainment that tries to clutch after our hearts at all times. And so at nighttime, we put our phones on the other side of the room and we read our different uh, autobiographies. It's been super encouraging. I've been loving it. Uh, it sets our minds on the, on the things above. We see how the people lived out their faith, were encouraged, and it's actually been a fun date activity as we read each other our underlines, and I've really been enjoying it. But I was reading one of them, and this, this passage reminded me of it. It was a, a lady named Esther Ahn, and she was in Korea when Japan took over, and the situation that's painted is, it's legit Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they line everyone up and say, you need to bow to this false god. And so, She's the only one out of the whole area that doesn't. So they spot her, they capture her, but she actually ends up getting away. And she's preparing to be in prison because they know where she's at. And she's preparing, hearing the stories of those beaten in prison. She says this beautiful quote. She says, We were filled with the Holy Spirit and were convinced that it was more than an honor to die for the Lord. For us, it was a joyous blessing to have been born in such a place and for such a time. I realized that it was because of this persecution that I was able to truly experience God's presence and trust his promises. It's just remarkable. She was, as we saw, she said, full of the Holy Spirit, and so that she was in the biggest persecution. She's about to go suffer, and she does, and she is thanking God that she was born in such a time as this. And she knew that because of these trials, she was able to experience God's blessings even more. And this is the consistent testimony we see of, of amazing men and women of the faith throughout history, but also throughout Scripture. This is how Paul and Silas could worship in, in prison. It's also how we see Stephen rejoicing when he is being martyred. It says that it, with the face of an angel, his face glowed. And listen to the wording of this in Acts 7.55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And it's just amazing that in suffering for Christ, God turns it around and he ultimately blesses the believer. And so this is a dear promise that we can have, that we need, and we need to hold on to when suffering comes our way. And it should also propel our hearts to pray this and pray for our brothers around the world who are undergoing that suffering now. And so this is Peter's first truth. It was quite packed that God's hand is everywhere in our suffering. It's in accordance with his plan. It's a special tool that he uses to refine us and to reveal true faith, preparing us for the grand joy to come. And in this suffering, he is intimately with us and giving us a foretaste of future glory of Christ, and he uses it to bless us. And if you thought that first truth was packed, so is his second. And so let's move on to his second truth about suffering, that there is a bigger picture to our suffering. You know when we get a hangnail? or like a minor injury, and our tendency is just to focus in on it, and forget the bigger stuff around us. I've actually been thinking about that a lot this week. I've had a hangnail. It's been super annoying. But it helps when we zoom out and see the bigger picture. I mean, imagine if I got a hangnail on my wedding day, and I spent the whole day being like, life is just not worth living. I'd be a fool. Would I not? And yet this is what we do with trials. Trials, they cause pain, and we just zoom in on it as if it is everything. And so Peter, he's trying to get us to zoom out, to zoom out from our finger and see what God is doing through it. And so part of this big picture view, first he shows us that suffering is a unique opportunity to glorify God. Let's read verse 15 through 16. He says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So first what he does in this passage is he's going to make some clarifications about what does not count as suffering for Christ, which has fascinated me. Why did Peter have to say this? I thought this should be pretty self-explanatory. Don't murder, don't be a thief. So why is he saying this? I think one level, he knows the human heart, and so he's just taught us that suffering, it's valuable, uh, but he doesn't want us to rationalize. He doesn't let us have any room to rationalize and think that all of our suffering is suffering for Christ. And so he doesn't let us do that, and he says that doesn't count if you're suffering for unrighteousness. So that's one level. 
But there's another level, which I think we can see when we ask, why these specific sins? Like, if I was writing you guys a letter and encouraging in your suffering, I feel like I probably wouldn't write in there like, hey, by the way, don't murder. Oh, but when I'm gone, don't be stealing. So why these sins? I feel like murder should never been something on the table. But perhaps when we really ponder their circumstances, that in the times of grave, grave persecution, persecutors, they hurt them bad. And the temptation is to strike back, to strike back, to fight fire with fire, to respond to fiery trial, lashing out in fiery retaliation. And so murder, though you're right, it should never be on the table. It could be the natural response. If in persecution they put someone you love in jail, or if they murdered someone you love right in front of your eyes, then yeah, there could be murder. Or similar manner with being a thief. If they steal and plunder your property, like we saw happen in Hebrews, where their property was confiscated for the name of Christ, it could be easy to justify, they stole from me, so I should be able to steal back. And so he continues. He says, one, those are not, not acceptable for a Christian, but he continues from the most extreme of murder to the less of stealing to then to general evil doing. That's anything at the criminal level, but it can even be broader than that. And so he tells us, do none of those things in our suffering. And then interestingly, he adds one more item to the list, but it's in a, kind of a different category than the other three. He says, being a meddler. Now, this word has commentators killing trees galore. Um, there's been so much written about this one word because it's only found here, not only in the Bible, but also in Greek literature. And so that's a commentator's dream to speculate as much as they can. But what I've gathered, I pieced together, is that Peter seems to be fusing two words, coining his own term. And it's those, those fused words, it has the idea of sticking your nose into things that don't pertain to you. A literal rendition reads, one meddling in things alien to his calling. Or as one commentator insightfully suggested, this could mean that some disciples in their zeal for the truth and resentment of paganism were causing trouble in society for reasons beyond a sincere and legitimate concern for the gospel. And so in zeal for the gospel, it may have caused them to act tactlessly or act without social graces or just plain sticking their nose in other people's businesses where it doesn't belong. And so I think the translation we have is very fitting, being a meddler. And so he ends this list of things with not, something seemingly not so bad. And we see that he ordered it in a scale from extreme of murder to less extreme thievery, to less extreme just general evildoing, something that may not even be inherently sinful, meddling. But none of these are appropriate for the Christian calling. In the, in the midst of a fiery trial, it's not an appropriate response to fight fire with fiery. And actually, when we do so, we undermine our greater goal of glorifying God. We undermine the claims of the gospel we preach. I mean, take stealing, for example. When we steal in return, yeah, you can logic it at one example, or one, at one level, but when we steal, we undermine our claims of our true inheritance and our true treasure being in Christ that can't be taken away. And so we undermine the very gospel that we're suffering for. And so, no, we're not to do any of those. If we do those, you ought to feel ashamed. They are shameful acts. But we ought not to feel ashamed of suffering for Christ's sake, verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So suffering for ungodliness is not fitting for a Christian, but suffering as a Christian is. And that term Christian, we're obviously familiar with it for our entire lives, it means Christ's follower, but it was a new term in Peter's time, and it was based off of its two usages in Acts, it seems like it was a derogatory label. It was something that they threw as a slur. Those Christians, those followers of Christ following a dead guy. And so although it was a derogatory slur, it was, he tells us it's something not to be ashamed of, which always is interesting when he says things like that. Just don't be ashamed. Like, yep, nope, done being ashamed. How do I do that? How do I do that in my heart? And I think the answer is in the next phrase. It says, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So we need to shift our view to God's view, recognizing that being a Christian is an opportunity and a privilege to glorify God, especially in the manner that we suffer for his name. Because in suffering, we get to glorify him in a special way. We get to rejoice in him and so demonstrate his value that surpasses our circumstance. 
in suffering, we get to glorify him by showing that his opinion and his verdict is more important than anyone else's insults. That what he says is reality. And as we see that, we realize it's nothing to be ashamed of, but it's a privilege to stand with Christ in his sufferings. And so we need to meditate on his words, taking hold of them by faith, and so that these truths, they become a reality to our hearts. They sink in deep, so deep that our hearts aren't ashamed, but we realize that it's an honor to suffer for Christ. And while it's clear that his focus has been on persecution, there's also a good question for our hearts here, more general application. I was actually blessed by this this week uh, as I was chewing on this verse, and I woke up one of the days this week. I've been struggling with health this week, so I've been, I've been pretty tired. Um, and I woke up and I pray, was praying with Amber, and my prayer was pretty much, God, I'm selfish, I'm tired, I do not want to love anyone else, and I have meetups all day. Um, help me love them and glorify you. And so I was then driving to my meetup after that, and I was chewing on this and then asking that question that I want to ask, which is how can I glorify you, God, specially in trials? That's the question I want you to propose to your own hearts. In trials, there is opportunity to glorify God specially. And it was cool. I, I found so much encouragement to keep going. because I was like, well, Lord, this is where you can glorify yourself greatly because I'm tired. I'm more prone to my normal sin thought struggles. Have victory. Lord, I'm super prone to selfishness right now. Have victory and show the value of Christ. And so that's the question I want you to propose to your hearts. And so, seeing this bigger picture suffering, when we see suffering in its proper context, we see that it's a golden opportunity to look different than the world. Not to suffer for sins, but to suffer for him, seeing the eternal value of getting to glorify him now, to suffer for his name's sake. But then he keeps with that zoomed out picture, showing us that this is ultimately also part of discipline. It's for our good discipline. Let's read verses 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So let's break down what he's saying here. He starts by telling us in verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. So the ones being discussed are the household of God, or in verse 18 it calls us the righteous, are those who obey the gospel, who believe. Christians, it's the church. This is what Peter actually tells us. He calls us the house of God. In 1 Peter 2, 5, he says, we like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. So we are that house. And he tells us that judgment begins with us. Meaning what? Well, rather than the idea of, that we normally picture with judgment, the judicial verdict of declaring something guilty versus not guilty, it's an act of disciplinary judgment and he disciplines us through judgment through our sufferings now. And this is not to condemn. The verdict is already not guilty. That's very clear in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There is no guilty verdict. So this isn't a condemning judgment. Rather, it's a purifying judgment of beloved children. Look how Paul words it in 1 Corinthians 11.32. He says, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we, we may not be condemned along with the world. And so God's judgment, it's not one-dimensional. He is not only uses it to judge the world, but he disciplines us now so we're not condemned along with the world. But it's also true that discipline is still going to sting. It still burns. It still flames. And so Peter tells us this when he adds more detail in the next verse. So, and Peter actually should clarify now. Peter, in verse 17 and 18, he is saying the same point in parallel lines. I Got a little slide here, just so you can see him. So this is the first half of both of those verses. He's making the same point, and he's using a proverb in verse 18 to see this truth through a proverbial wisdom. And so this is Proverbs 11.31. And so he says in verse 18, if the righteous is scarcely saved, that's parallel to judgment beginning with the household of God. And so this proverb, it adds extra insight when he's saying that it's scar we're scarcely saved. Uh, when I first read that, I interpreted it wrong. He's not saying that you're barely saved as in that the eternal blood of Christ was barely enough to save us from our unrighteousness. And that term scarcely, it can be rendered accurately with difficulty, that we need to go through the fires of divine discipline and it will not be easy. We will have hardship. 
which is what Paul encourages believers in Acts 14, 22. He says that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, the judgment's severe. We know how major the sufferings and trials can be now. But this fiery trial that's used to purify us is a premonition and a foreshadowing of the fiery judgment that will come on the unbeliever. And that ought to make us shudder. For what will be the fate of the unbeliever? And that's what he asks in the end of verse 17. He says, and if judgment, he's referring to judgment, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so we see the same point in the parallel clause. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And so Peter, he makes us consider what's going to be the outcome for the unbeliever. And he calls them a term ungodly and sinner. Ungodly, it captures that idea of someone who does not fear God. They lack submission to God. And then the outflow of that term is the sinner, the, the breaking God's holy decrees, living unto evil desires. And so a person like this, the ungodly sinner, is someone who does not obey the gospel of God, it calls it. The gospel of God. Gospel is the good news and is of God. It's his own message of salvation. It carries his supreme authority, and rejecting the gospel of salvation is to spit on the face of the living God. And what is to be the fate of such a one? Horrifying and dreadful. And you'll notice, Peter doesn't answer these questions. It's rhetorical. He expects us to supply the answer. One commentator poetically put it, the solemn question is left unanswered. It is as if faith itself feared to follow the outcast into the outer darkness. And it's dreadful indeed. If you today are not a believer, you should shudder because here is the answer to your fate, to the question that Peter has asked. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9, starting in verse 6. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the, punish the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. If you are not a believer of the gospel, you will be forever banished from the blessed presence of God and eternally pressed under the weight of his fiery wrath, forever weeping and gnashing of teeth. Without hope, without change of fate, it's dreadful and it will be unchanging. And so if that is you, I pray and ask that you stop rejecting the gospel. Put your faith in Christ. Repent of your sins. Live your life with him as your Lord. But do not trifle with God. Do not reject his gospel for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. For the Christian, this ought to put things in perspective. Because if this discipline of a son is so severe, the fire that purifies the faith, the, God, the, uh, the gold, like gold is so hot, the flame is going to be so much hotter as it condemns those who have disobeyed the gospel. And it's got to put our, our suffering in proper lens. It's caused us first to pity the assailant. When they inflict us for following Christ, the temptation is to hate them. But know their fate. If they aren't saved, we got to mourn for them. And I want to stop and take a moment to ask you, when someone does you wrong, for Christ's sake or just in general, how do you view them? Does your heart break knowing that their eternal destiny is hell? Or are you just bent out of shape because you were treated unjustly, treated wrong, and you want them to know? Do you have the heart of Christ who was praying for those who were laughing and spitting at him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And he did that all from nail-pierced hands hanging there on the cross. Do you pity them and want that they be spared from eternal wrath like we were? For we're just recipients of grace. Do you pray for their salvation? And so this perspective has first got to add compassion for the sinner, but it also puts the proper lens that making us thankful for the discipline now. This is so infinitely better to endure the persecution of man and suffering now than the eternal wrath of God. But not only that, it's God's grace disciplining us as we, as we need it. It's for our good and for his glory. 
And so we need to keep an eye on the bigger picture to endure this temporary suffering, to endure these light and momentary troubles with joy. And so seeing more God's picture, it should cause us to glorify him in our suffering, to look for that opportunity, and it also should make us a people of compassion and thankfulness. And then both of these truths, these big truths of, of Peter, seeing God's ordaining hand and seeing the bigger picture of suffering, there is an appropriate response. And that's his application, and he makes it very clear in verse 19. Entrust yourself to God. Let's read verse 19. He says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so he says, therefore, in conclusion of the matter, or conclusion actually of his whole topic and theme of suffering, which is this, and do not miss this. Because honestly, if you miss this verse, if you miss this idea, you've missed one of the most central ideas to 1 Peter. And that, that those who suffer according to God's will, well, let me just clarify, on God's will, when he brings that back out, he says it's in accordance with God's plan. It's good and wise. It's not a, a matter of random chance. When we suffer according to God's will, there's a command. And what is that command? Entrust your soul to the faithful creator. It's a very big concept to Peter, entrusting your being to him. That word entrust, it was used uh, in the context of entrusting money or valuable possessions to someone for safekeeping. Because back, back then when this was written, they didn't really have banks. We just have our money in the bank, but they didn't have that. And so if you were going to leave on a trip, you had to give your money and your most valuable possessions to a neighbor or a friend, and they were going to guard it with their life. And so ultimately, that's what we're called to do in the face of injustice, is to entrust our souls to God, to take our eyes off of our opposer, off of ourselves, and onto our trustworthy gods, to lay our souls before him. For you, God, made my soul. You saved my soul. You'll protect my soul. Do what you think is best. And we can do that, and we must do that, because look how it describes him. It calls him our faithful creator. This description was not accidental. In fact, the term creator, it's the only time it's used in the New Testament is right here. He does say God creates elsewhere, but the only time is he calls him a creator is here. By calling him this, Peter, he's bringing into view his sovereign rule, his reign. This is the one who brought into existence all the galaxies, everything that we know with the word of his mouth. And he's infinitely wise and infinitely powerful, and he can perfectly complete his will. So that's what we see when he says creator, but he also describes him as a faithful creator. He's faithful to keep his promises, never to forsake his people, but ultimately he will vindicate us and he will preserve his people for eternal bliss. So when he says faithful creator, he's his creator, ensuring that he has the power and the wisdom to do as he wills, and he's also the faithful one, preserving and forever doing what is best for us and for his glory. And so it's to him we must entrust our souls. There is no one more trustworthy. And so what does this look like to entrust our souls? Let's look to Christ's example. He's done it before us in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. Turn with me there. 1 Peter 2, 21. Verse 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sins, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, same word as insult, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So Jesus, he entrusted himself to God until the final moment. Luke 23, 46, it says that, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Commit and trust. Same word. And having said that, he breathed his last. So committing and trusting ourselves. And Jesus, he knew when he was being reviled and that he was being condemned unjustly. He never sinned. And with the full power of heaven at his disposal, he could have sm smitten, smite the enemies right there. And yet he instead, he found rest in the Father. He knew that God sees, he knows, and he will judge justly. So he didn't he need to go prove himself. He didn't know he needed to prove to everyone he's innocent he could continue to love his enemies, praying that God forgive them, trusting that God would judge. And this is what it ought to look like for the Christian, the Christ follower. When we're mistreated, reviled, insulted, defamed, right? we don't need to go run, prove that our accusers wrong. 
We need to hand over the case to God, lay it before our faithful creator. And when you truly entrust your case to the Lord, you know that he's going to handle justice. It frees you. It frees you to do what's called for us in the last phrase of today's passage. It says, entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We're to keep doing good, keep loving our enemies, keep praying for them, keep blessing those who curse us. We need to guard this behavior with a sturdy shield, not damaging the proclamation of the gospel of infinite worth. But we need to back up our proclamation of the gospel with good deeds, even in the face of suffering, even when we're most prone to look inwardly. The time when we're most likely to sin in return. And so I encourage you and myself as well, when we suffer, we need to take our eyes off ourselves and put them on our faithful creator who will not fail us. When we keep our eyes on him and rest in his, his knowledge, in his verdict, that's where we find the power to keep loving and do glory, do good for the glory of his name. And so again, while this is the main idea here is persecution, there's still another question we can apply for ourselves in the normal trials of life, non-persecution, in trials. How do you respond? What is the demeanor of your heart? When you suffer, are you flabbergasted? can't believe this is happening do you get mad at god how could he let this happen to me do you feel hurt by god why would he put me through all this do you get embittered at god all of these they reveal a narrow view a self-centered view our god who sovereignly ordains persecution of his saints is the same faithful creator ordaining all your trials working on an eternal scare of glory that we can't even fathom, but in eternity we will, and we'll see, and we'll marvel. This is the same faithful creator who's promising that all things will turn out for your good. This is the same God who's worthy of our trust. And so when trials strike now, continue to draw to him. Don't flee from him. Don't harbor all these feelings, but bring them to him and run to him, and it can be hard. As Psalm 62, 8 says, a favorite of mine. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Trust him in the trial. Fight to fill in your perspective with the truths of what God is doing in the trial. And for the parts where we don't understand or we can't see, we need to trust him. And let this be our normal practice in trials so that when he cranks up the persecution and the heat, that the path of running to God's throne and laying our, our souls before him, it's so well-worn that it's very easy to find in times of intense trial. And so today, this is how Peter, he fills out the painting of suffering. With those initial strokes of black suffering, it's simply the center of a more beautiful picture. And so he's drawn on more petals. The whole picture, it looks much more beautiful when you see the whole. When you look at suffering, you know that God ordains it. See that what's in his plan is a tool that he uses to intentionally grow and reveal faith. And he does it, and while he's doing that construction on our heart, he uses it to turn around and bless us, and he will be with us in trial. There's that next pedal that there, there's a bigger picture. It's a special opportunity, a special temporal opportunity to glorify God. And that this is really an experience of loving discipline. So we should enjoy that, and our hearts should break for those who are not saved. And we also should trust our God. We must be compelled to trust him. We need to behold him and trust that he's going to mete out justice. He's going to take care of our souls completely. And so we need to find rest in him. And by faith, we will find empowerment as we keep looking to him to continue forth in good for the glory of our God. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. You are good in control of all things. And you have seen it wise and fitting for Jesus to learn through suffering. And so how much more through his servants. And so when suffering comes, Lord, may we know these truths. May we internalize them and take hold of them by faith. And may we trust you. Your hand's all over it. May we praise you and may we glorify you in trials.
And may we faithfully endure till in heaven when we see, when the curtain is, is lifted, all the good that we didn't even know possible that you were doing through it. May we trust you. May all this be done to the glory of your name. Amen.